Hello lads! So, before we get started, I just want to let you know that this video was brought to you in partnership with the fine folks over at Lofi, who just a few weeks ago reached out to ask if I would test and debut their brand new free camera mode. Naturally, I jumped at the opportunity because this is going to be huge for creators like myself to capture dynamic and cinematic footage, as well as interesting screenshots for thumbnails. So all of the footage that you guys are going to see in the background of this video was taken and created using the new free camera mode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And of course, thank you Lo-Fi for helping me out with this video. So over the last three years, I've kind of positioned myself as a bit of a lore master and historian for the game of Kenji. And while I do have a decent sized collection of content documenting the history and lore of Kenji, I know that there's a lot of things that the community wants to know that maybe I haven't covered yet. And in order to address some of those unanswered questions, I set up an AMA on Reddit in which you, the community, could reach out to me directly to ask all of your lore-based questions, and I would do my best to answer them. So wasting no more time, let's go ahead and get started. How many empires were there again? And also, an idea that popped in my head, is there any evidence that the empires might have been transplanetary? I mean, the moon is pretty close to the world, and there are some machineries found around Kenshi that seem to be quite big. So is there any possibility of it? Uh, the empires being planet colonizers and Kenshi being a colony that went awry. All right, so first things first, um, there, as we know it, there have been two great empires. And I say great empires because um, technically speaking, the United Cities is an empire, but it is a pale comparison to that of either of the first or second empires on, in terms of both scale and operations. Um, as for the second question, I actually did take a good look at this very topic when I was making my lore videos on both the full history of the first empire and uh, the possible origins of the first empire as well. So I would recommend checking those out. But in summation, there is a good amount of evidence to suggest that they were transplanetary in some fashion based just on the level of technology that they had. Um, and I mean, that was things like the a mass AI construction, uh, the space elevator, access to orbital equipment, and then also the notable lack of evidence of any civilization or structures that seem to predate the first empire. Uh, but I personally am of the belief that based on the fact that there is not any evidence that the overarching empire, um, you know, came back during the time of the Skeleton Rebellion, that they were either a colony that was sent out uh, amongst the stars to kind of reach out beyond the empire, and they're now outside the reach of the empire, depending on the level of technology they may have had. Um, you know, that could be due to distance or time or that they were refugees or exiles during a some 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 kind of uh, societal collapse that had occurred um, either on the planet that is above Kenshi or some nearby planet. And we, we may never know the full extent of this situation, uh, but there is a decent amount of evidence to support, you know, both claims. What's up with Kenshi being set on one of the moons orbiting a planet? Is there any information in the lore as to what's up with the other moons or the planet itself? And why and how is the moon habitable? It shouldn't be able to hold an atmosphere, let alone have temperatures suitable for life of any form. Um, so this is actually a really good question because uh, in all honesty, we don't have a lot of information on the other moons around Kenji or uh, even the planet that Kenji orbits. Uh, although if my theory on the origins of the first empire is to be believed, it is possible that the planet above Kenji is actually the original planet of the humans from the first empire that came uh, you know, here from another world, and they were either fleeing some kind of societal collapse or cataclysm, but it's also very well possible that the planet is just, you know, a planet, and that Kenshi was more habitable than the planet itself, and they just came here to colonize it instead, or maybe it had resources that are not available on the planet. Maybe they came here with a specific goal in mind. As for why the moon is habitable in the first place, there are actually examples in, in the real world of uh, moons being more habitable than the planets they orbit. Uh, Saturn's moon Titan is a fantastic example of being a more habitable option uh, than the planet itself. In fact, in the future, uh, we could very well be trying to send people to Titan to, you know, have expeditions and whatnot to, to form colonies on, on the moon because the, it has an atmosphere um, that is almost habitable for humans based on our, uh, our information. So we could very well be living on a moon in the future that orbits a planet that we are not capable of living on. Um, in terms of Kenshi, there is some evidence that the eye satellites were used to terraform uh, the moon, breaking down, you know, hazardous material, releasing chemical compounds that may have been very deep within the moon that are required to create life, uh, as well as making the ground more fertile and capable of sowing plant life and building an atmosphere similar to um, the way that life on Earth was started by comets smashing into it, carrying those components, um, and eventually making an atmosphere. But they could have also, you know, artificially done the same thing, making the moon more habitable for human life, which 
you know, would consider a, a I would consider that a probable explanation as they were a spacefaring civilization that uh, were capable of colonizing planets and moons. So it is kind of realistic, but the most likely uh, scenario there is that there was already life on the moon um, just by nature of the you know kaiju-like beings that I discussed in the history of the first empire as well as a little bit in the origins of the first empire videos you know the empire fought against these these large organic creatures and that's why they made the behemoths in the first place so there probably was life on the moon prior to their arrival um, they may have just colonized it and terraformed it to make it more specifically suitable for humans uh, but there, there's evidence to support that the moon was already habitable, um, already had life, and they just came here and colonized it as is. Do you think that Shek will appear human, or at least more human in Kenshi 2, considering the setting? So, uh, I can tell you what the lore is going to say, but whether it's going to be implemented in Kenshi 2 this way is kind of a different story. Uh, I mean, Chris has gone on uh, record on his own AMA that he did on here, saying that lore for Kenshi is prone to changing during the development of Kenshi 2, and that's, you know, some things are going to be retcon, and we kind of we have to accept that, and that, that's okay. Um, I only bring that up, though, because I'm not sure if they're going to want to make the races on Kenshi all look more human, because it kind of eliminates the variety and the differentiation between them, you know, the things that make them unique, and one of the things that people like about them is they all feel very unique to, to, to themselves and to their own individual races, so... I don't know if they're going to change that, um, even though the lore kind of pushes it in that direction. Uh, with that being said, according to the lore that we do know, uh, the Shek should appear more human. Granted, Kenshi 2 is supposed to take place just after the fall of the Second Empire, so by that time, the Shek should have been active for you know at least a couple decades, if not centuries, depending on how long the Second Empire spanned. Uh, but we don't really know or how long it lasted uh, or when the enforcers were implemented during that time. So it is possible that we may get Shek that are more human-like in appearance, but maybe just starting to show signs of those exoskeletons and that outer, you know, uh, bony armor that they, they have. Um, something kind of reminiscent to the, the Juggernaut mod that you see on the Steam Workshop, where they have those like bone inlays that are starting to develop into the skin, but they don't have that um, you know, the horns or the full exoskeleton that would later develop and become iconic of the Shek. So to kind of summarize, uh, they should look more human, but uh, we probably aren't going to see them be more human just because from a development standpoint, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't jive well with, you know, what I think the community would want. So with one of your theories, Skimmer plus human equals Hiver Queen, and then they're outfitted with an incubator to get past her being sterile, making Hivers and Skin Spiders. So, Bone Dog plus Human equals Shek and possibly Beak Things. Um, so, actually, one thing, let me correct that real fast. Uh, the, the theory wasn't necessarily Skimmer plus Human equals Hiver. It was that the Hivers were genetically modified humans in the same way that the Shek were, I mean, the Enforcers were genetically modified humans. Um, and they were specifically made to be more subservient because Catlon had started to kind of lose his mind by that point and he was worried about people turning traitor. Um, and he'd also just just finished up dealing with the uh, Ochre Knight uh, exodus that had occurred after that massive uh, rebellion that had occurred there as well. So he wanted a subservient workforce, um, and they had also just dealt with a massive famine due to the explosion in the grid. So now you have humans that are um, rebelling, and you also have humans that are starving under Catlon's rule. So he wanted a subservient workforce that required less food, um, and was going to be resistant to things like acid and radiation. And I only imagine that uh, just because, you know, that obviously they had their natural resistant, but the explosion that took out the grid was nuclear in origin. We know that because of the presence of titronite all around the crater and all around the grid. So um, he created, you know, these modified humans that were uh, subservient. They required less food. They were resistant to those, those kinds of things. And then the rejected byproducts of those experiments are the skin spiders and i believe that the individual that did all of this was uh the same one that we now know as the bug master he was also likely the one that created the enforcers for catlon as well um that would explain his deep-seated grudge for them um as for whether or not uh, bone dog dna was used in humans to create the enforcers that's very well possible uh you know we're not really sure exactly what the process of the modification entailed you know i don't know if the DNA came from a skimmer. I don't know if uh, the DNA for, for the uh, Shek came from bone dogs. 
Um, it is very well possible, though, that the Second Empire did use bone dog DNA to create those more loyal and aggressive and physically stronger human enforcers that would later evolve into the Shek. And that would actually explain some of their pack mentality that is, you know, baked into their culture with the idea of having like an alpha pack leader based on size, strength, and, and you know, uh, merit. Something that is also seen in the bone dogs around Kenshi. That's why you have, you know, bone dogs and then bone dog alphas. So um, it's very well possible. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of where I sit on all of that. Agnew can be found in the Tower of Abuse held by the Thrallmasters. They both have 50 combat stats and are referred to in their bounty as the Voodoo Brothers. However, they are different subclasses of skeletons, so this may just be a nickname. I mentioned Agnew, though, because soldier bots are rare in-game. He has the same color for his clothing as the Second Empire units, and it seems as if the air bots in the reprogramming workshop have a different color, along with way lower strength on average, so I don't think he's related to them. That brings me to my question, do we have any info on the brothers and what they're doing to Agnew? My headcanon is that because he has 50 strength, they might have been planning to make him another brother, or do you have any info on the thralling process itself? So firstly, you are correct about the robots in the reprogramming workshop. Their colors are kind of a deeper green, whereas Agnew is that second empire kind of gray-blue. As for Agnew himself, there's actually a bit of out-of-game lore for him that actually lends to and explains his lore in-game. So um, Agnew was named after Chris Hunt's motorcycle, which in turn was named after the headless attendant to President Nixon, Agnew from Futurama, due to its, quote, similar personality of loud growling and being impossible to control. So uh, given that information, his location in-game, the Second Empire faction colors that he has by default, and his particular model of skeleton, um, it's very likely that Agnew was actually a skeleton soldier in Catlon's Legion. Um, however, when Catlon started to kind of lose his mind, it is, you know, started suffering from that CPU bloat, um, he started enthralling his own Legion to keep them obedient to him. He was terrified that his people were going to turn, you know, turn turncoat on him. So the tower that Agnew's held in was actually very likely one of the facilities where this thralling would take place. Um, and Agnew's presence there, while still having his head, suggests that he's actually been able to resist the enthralling um, and was left in the cage simply because he could not be controlled. Um, Agnew is likely the only skeleton we have that was so strong-willed he could not be enthralled. Um, and, you know, that's, again, it's a homage to his namesake. Uh, and even after a thousand years in a cage without even his own voice to keep him company, he has resisted that madness, he's resisted the enthralling process, and he continues to resist CPU burnout despite being locked up for a thousand years. Um, he, he really is impossible to control, and that's honestly, that, that may be why his strength stat is so high when you find him. Now, we don't really know much about the enthralling process itself. We know that it involves for somehow removing the head of the skeleton, and that still allows the body to function and be aware of its surroundings, while simultaneously, you know, leaving it devoid of free will and essentially a mindless automaton that can be controlled. But we don't really know much more about the process itself since then. But Agnew, um, his presence in the tower suggests that there is some, some level of breaking in terms of willpower that has to happen prior to that that occurring um and I, we don't know how that's done but it's very well possible that the fact that agnew doesn't have access to his voice anymore could be a part of that process but we really don't know much more than the fact that it involves removing the head uh, lastly as for the voodoo brothers themselves uh they are skeletons that have likely had their cpus degenerated over years and years of refusing to do a cpu reset um, which is something that induces madness um obsessive compulsive thoughts and emotional instability. And I actually went over this really extensively in my Sadness of the Skeletons video. Um, but in, in short, skeletons are essentially forced to make a choice between maintaining their skills and their stats and the things that make them unique individuals and also make them qualified to do their jobs. Um, you know, some of these trades that they've spent decades or you know, centuries learning and they essentially have to reset those skills to prevent an emotional buildup of data in, in their minds and in their CPUs, otherwise they'll go insane. So they're constantly forced to choose between sanity and being able to maintain their individuality. And that's you know evident with Catlon and his paranoia, the Armor King and his paranoia and his obsession with selling, Tin Fist, his obsession with, with uh, fighting slavers, you know, that's really well documented. So um, like I said, I go over that in my Sadness of the Skeletons video, but these two skeletons in particular, the Voodoo Brothers, were very likely 
uh, the skeletons that were assigned by Catlon to do this enthralling. And over you know the last thousand years, as their CPU began to degrade and they started to develop those obsessed thoughts, they became more and more obsessed with doing it. And now in the modern day, they're still doing it. Um, they're hunting down skeletons, they're enthralling them, and they're, they're making them their slaves. It, the same thing they were doing for Catlon, but now Catlon's gone, but they're just, that's all they can do. So as for why they're called the Voodoo Brothers, it's probably a reference to the fact that they are, you know, a able to raise and enslave and control headless, you know, quote, zombie-like skeletons, which is a concept that is, like, typically associated with voodoo is, you know, controlling the dead and stuff like that. So that's kind of where that that's probably comes from. But um, that's, you know, everything I know about Agnew, uh, the enthralling process and the Voodoo Brothers. Do you think the Fishmen were genetically created in the same vein as the Shek and the Hivers? So in full transparency, the Fishmen have always been a bit of an anomaly to me. Um, there's a couple different ideas that I floated around, one being that they may have been genetic creations of the First Empire, uh, but that's mostly based on the fact that there is the presence of a, a First Empire lab on the Fishman Isles. Now, uh, many people often think that the Hybers are the original denizens of Kenshi. Uh, as you guys you know, should know by this point, I don't really subscribe to that concept. I think there's a lot of evidence that the Hybers were originally humans that were genetically modified into their current state and evolved over a thousand, you know, the last thousand years plus since the Second Empire's collapse. And this could have easily been done in response to the famine that befell the Second Empire after the explosion of the grid wiped out their food supply. And it would also explain why the Hybers uh, were never seen on the moon of Kenshi prior to the Second Empire, which is when they would have been, you know, completed as the famine was like the second to last thing that happened before the Empire fully collapsed. The reason why I bring all that up is that it is more likely to me that the Fishmen are the actual natives of Kenshi and that they live under the water and have so for who knows how long and they're only just now starting to come out of the water. But it's really hard to say because we don't really have much information on them other than the fact that they exist um, and they attacked a settlement that was on the Fishman Isles. But there's really no context clues or anything to kind of explain what they are, just that they are Fishmen. I, I suppose it's possible that like the Hivers and the Shek, they were a genetic experiment of, you know, the first empire rather than the second, like the, uh, you know, the, the former. Um, and they were maybe trying to create a race of aquatic beings or, or something of the sort, but we, we don't really know. And that, that's kind of a stretch. So, uh, especially since we know that the Shek originated in the second empire as enforcers, that's documented. The Hivers didn't appear until the collapse of the Second Empire, which lines up with the theory that they were made by the Second Empire. But the Fishmen seem like a relatively new problem, um, which leads me to believe that they are actually native to Kenshi, but are only just now emerging from the water. So, you know, who knows? But uh, like I said, the Fishmen have always been a, been a bit of an anomaly to me. Catlon and the remnants of his government are huddled in weird containers under what looks like a space elevator. Were they trying to escape, and are they waiting for a ride? So most evidence actually suggests that uh, Catlon had built the Second Empire on the ruins of the Collapse First, and that the capital of the First Empire was also in the Ashlands, um, and that a lot of megalithic structures like the uh, space elevator and the high-tech structures and the massive buildings are actually ruined remains of the first empire, not the second. Um, and this is backed up by the fact that we only ever see structures of that scale and of that level of sophistication and technology in areas that were controlled by the first empire, places like the floodlands, um, like the deadlands, uh, the you know strange skyscraper structures that litter the landscape and you know below Iraq and in places like that. All of these structures date back to the first empire. Um, whereas the Second Empire, while having large and imposing structures like the citadels and stuff like that, uh, were, were largely made of sandstone and cement and scrap metal and had a very specific, you know, uh, set of building materials and themes. So, you know, considering all that, it's likely that Catlon was living in the rubble of the First Empire and made that area his seat of power in the capital of his second. And this was probably due to uh, the ability to repurpose the tech from the fall of the first that is in that area. You know, it's reasonable that he repurposed a lot of the stuff that was left behind after that first genocide and after, you know, the Age of Chaos. Now, the Ashland Domes specifically 
almost to me look like drop pods, you know, something that could be dropped from orbit onto the moon to deliver supplies or even, you know, transfer people when they came to colonize the moon in the first place. So, um, you know, Catlon may have taken those and repurposed them uh, after the Empire collapsed. And this is kind of given credence by the fact that other than the one dome that we see in Sonora's Dark, we don't see those domes anywhere outside the Ashlands. And even the one in Sonora's Dark is right on the border of the Ashlands. Um, and you would think that if Catlon had built them himself, he would have, you know, built them in other places. They're very, like, good for what they're using them for. They're very functional. Um, it would make sense that he would have more of those buildings throughout uh, the, you know, the continent on Kenji, but we don't, we don't see them. Now, as for if they're waiting to go back up into space or anything like that, I, I doubt it. Um, you know, the skeletons are very aware of the crimes they committed. Um, they're also very aware that the time of the First Empire has long since passed and that no one is coming to save them. Um, and they're pretty much riddled with guilt and self-loathing as a result of that, which is um, something I've talked about in several of my videos. So, you know, no, I, I don't think that, uh, that, you know, he's waiting for anyone to come back and get him or for him to go back up through the space elevator or anything like that. I think that he exiled himself to a place that is quite literally a graveyard and memoriam dedicated to the failings of his kind and the collapsed ruins of not only the first empire but the second empire as well both of which he and his kind facilitated the collapse for um you know it's kind of the perfect spot for that he, he's right under the space elevator and it's kind of like a, a shining testament to his failure as a leader and it's almost morbidly poetic in a way because he entombed himself in his own failures while simultaneously denying they exist. All right, I see nobody asked it yet. So can a Greenlander or Scorchlander have a child with a Shek? So I'll be short on this one, uh, but th you know, from a lore perspective, I haven't seen any examples of crossbreeding. I imagine earlier in the lore, uh, the Enforcers may have been able to have children with humans as they were you know, nearly identical um, it is possible that while they are no longer the same species, they could still exist within the same genus or be close enough genetically that they could theoretically have offspring, but it would likely result in a sterile hybrid similar to a liger or a mule or, you know, a hennies or something like that. But uh, that, that's kind of all I'll say on that. How is it possible for Kenji to have a day-night cycle? as the moon is tightly locked unless there is, you know, a smaller star-like object that orbits it, but that seems very strange for such an event to occur as stars are usually larger than planets and way larger than moons. Do you think there is some kind of man-made object that orbits the moon that provides light, or maybe some sort of satellite built to mimic the sun? Um, do you think this was just dev oversight? If the humans wanted to make the moon habitable, they would need sunlight to grow plants. They could use hydroponics, but the sunlight would also be used to make electricity, or they could use wind and water, both of which are available in abundance on the moon. So the question is, since we have the technology and resources to survive without the sun, why did they build a fake sun just to see, see better? Convenience? Question mark. I would like your opinion on this, or is this just uh, dev oversight or well thought out sci-fi lore? Okay, so this is a very multifaceted question, and it has a lot of uh, intricate details to answer, so um, try to bear with me while I go through that. Uh, the a tidal lock planet won't experience a day-night cycle because it rotates at the same pace as orbit. However, that is not the same case for a moon. Um, a moon that is tidally locked around a planet that is not tidally locked will experience a day-night cycle. Um, the discrepancy that we experience in Kenshi is that it should probably be a very long day-night cycle. You know, for example, our own moon is tidally locked, but it does in fact experience a day-night cycle. There is no dark side of the moon. There is a far side of the moon. Both sides do get, you know, sunlight. It's just we only see one side because it rotates at the same speed as it orbits the planet. Um, so the, the discrepancy on Kenshi is the length of the day-night cycle, not the presence of it. You know, the day-night cycle on our moon is two weeks, whereas Kenshi, they experience about 19 hours to 20 hours of daylight and then five or six hours of night. Um, so, you know, contrary to popular belief, the issue is not that it is tidally locked, so it should not have a day-night cycle. It is that um, the day-night cycle is not conducive with what a day-night cycle for a tidally locked moon is, is usually. But there are a lot of things we don't know about the planet's around Kenji, the planet that Kenji orbits, the other moons, they could have fast orbits or erratic rotations. We have no idea what that is. So um, all of this is still very possible. We just, we don't know enough about the solar system 
um, around Kenji or even the planet that it, it orbits to really say one way or the other. Now, as for your question on whether or not the First Empire may have been more involved with making the moon habitable, uh, the moon was almost definitely habitable for life, maybe just not ideal for human life when they arrived. We know this um, because of the kaiju-like beings that the First Empire fought using the behemoths, which were already present on Kenji. And, you know, I, I cover the, that whole uh, portion of the lore pretty extensively in my video on the full history of the First Empire. But to kind of keep things moving... Um, they, they did do a little bit of work to make the moon more habitable, and that's evidenced by the eye satellites, which they likely used to uh, create you know landscapes that were more fertile for agriculture and clear areas out for settlement like the ashlands, which uh, being you know volcanic in nature or near those natural volcanic hotspots would you know yield a great source of thermal energy for them to harness for their machines. And uh, I bring all of this up because it is evident to me that they used a lot less invasive methods to make the moon more ideal and habitable for them as opposed to retrofitting an entire star system to suit their needs with like an artificial sun or a Dyson sphere or anything like that. Um, if, if they were capable of doing that and they were that, you know, a civilization that high up on the Kardashev scale, I, I sincerely doubt that they would have fallen so drastically to the skeleton uprising after, you know, the events at Obedience and all that stuff. Um, they, I, I sincerely doubt that the skeletons would have been able to successfully um, overthrow them the way they did. Why Catlon Re? Um, so that's actually a really easy one. Uh, his mind is basically fractured with madness as a result of an emotional overload and CPU bloat. Uh, which is again a problem I detail pretty thoroughly in my video on the uh, the sadness of the skeletons. Um, as for the sound, you know, as much as we want to read it as like a high pitched human like re noise, um, and as how honestly how hilarious that would be, it's likely more of like a glitched out robotic roar, kind of akin to the Geth hunters from Mass Effect, if you're familiar, or the glitches that occur when you're listening to Ortis speak on Warframe. Um, it, you know, that kind of undulated, glitched out screech that he does when he's like mid-word and it starts like repeating super quick. Um, it's probably something like that. And uh, last question wasn't Kenji related, but I happily answered anyway. Uh, what was your favorite scene in the movie Hackers? Um, honestly, I can't say that I've seen the movie Hackers. Uh, I enjoy a lot of 70s and 80s and 90s movies and TV shows as I grew up uh, watching them with my dad. I was, you know, born in the mid to late 90s, so, uh, but I was, you know, either high sci-fi or some blend of fantasy, so like things like Highlander, Tremors, Quantum Leap, the original Total Recall, and Judge Dredd. Um, if it was more of a semi-modern setting, it was usually things like Back to the Future, the Predator movies, and, you know, the Terminator, so stuff like that. All right, so that about wraps this up. There are a couple questions on the original Reddit post that I did not get a chance to answer, but I will link that down below so you guys can go ahead and check them out. Kind of read through some of those responses if there's maybe something in there that I didn't cover that you wanted an answer for as well. Uh, my answers are posted in there. So uh, this is not the last one of these that I'm going to do, so keep an eye out on the community tab. Keep an eye out on r slash Kenshi on Reddit for these in the future. And if you guys have a question and you ask it, you may be featured in an upcoming AMA video like this one. So... Um, it was really cool to, you know, get a chance to interact with and nerd out with everybody uh, on a more personalized basis. So that was really cool. Um, and then lastly, again, thank you, huge thank you to the folks over at LoFi for giving me early access to test out and debut this new free camera mode. I hope you guys love the footage that you saw. It was a lot of fun getting it. Um, this is a fantastic tool. It is absolutely stunning um, and I'm super excited to use it. So I sincerely appreciate you guys uh, listening to me prattle on for the last half an hour. Uh, use your powers for good instead of evil, make a difference in someone's life, and uh, don't look at UC nobles, they're, they're jerks. <laughs>